able to 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 see God doing some really mighty things. Uh, an example would be that uh, in in Cheshire, in uh, one of my churches there, where we saw the greatest probably revival and healings and miracles, we ran Alpha for six years, uh, three times a year, and that was certainly one route. Uh, by which many came to faith and joined the church and were able to use the gifts that the Holy Spirit had given to them. But in amongst that, we our young people came on and we had nine, I think, nine prayer groups, one of which was called the Timothy Prayer Group. And uh, the young people prayed. They met together and they prayed, some of them in school, in the high school, others uh, in the youth club, in the fellowship group. And the result of that was this Timothy prayer group grew and grew. And um, part of the numbers would come to all the Alpha conferences and they would go in the prayer room virtually for the whole period of the conference, the whole day, while they sought the Lord, got pictures, words, put them onto whiteboards and then brought them in at different intervals where we shared the word. And how utterly awesome for them, how God blessed them when uh, people responded to the words of knowledge and the prophetic words and and came forward and God again touched many people. So that was a wonderful thing. Uh, we had a men's prayer group, which uh, was something that was on my heart very much with a lot of um, uh, wives, middle aged and slightly older in the church when I started and we were lacking the husbands. So we had a men's prayer group that met on a Saturday morning and began at 730 with some toast about all we were capable of cooking, perhaps. And uh, and then we would pray. And we had a hit list of uh, 10 men. Um, all the names, you, most of them were, were husbands of women in the church. And we prayed for them until uh, one by one, not all of them, but most of them became Christians and joined the church and took active roles within the life of the church. When, when somebody was converted, we just simply added another name from the reserve lift that that was a very exciting time and it was good for the men to see answers to prayer and to be able to pray in a small group with men as opposed to out loud um, in services with some of them quite reluctant at first um, and just to see the healing groups we had a big ministry team uh, who ministered at big conferences national conferences as well we trained other church leaders so yes lots of different things at different times and it, I have to say, uh, seasons, um, the Lord took me away from the excitement and the uh, busyness of, of most of that. When I moved down to Hampshire, we still had wonderful Holy Spirit ministry. We had conferences. We had all sorts of things going on, but it wasn't the same. And the ministry changed for me to more teaching as I for the first time, was invited to go and join the staff as a part-time teacher at a, a theological college. And um, that was quite an experience. And I suppose all of those are the Lord's way of preparing you for what he knows is going to come next. Yes. Um, we never know. <laughs> and if we'd have known then what we know now, we would have probably run away. <laughs> so I think, yeah, the Lord's been absolutely wonderful and i share the sort of faith that brenda has that god's not finished in many ways with us right up until the off um people will be called upon to share their testimonies uh, and see others brought to faith through the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and to not be afraid to give an account of their faith in the lord jesus christ particularly in these days so we're in we're in these days now of a i'm not sure in my own mind whether there's a final harvest now i believe more in a big harvest during the um tribulation period which is very clearly stated um but certainly we with no let off and so it's good to hear that there's revival plans all, all around we must keep making them and we must be found at work we must be found faithful when he comes because he said it's a very frightening word really will i find faith when i come to earth well on this group he will a hundred percent and and on many other groups that we've the privilege of sharing with these days 
So, yes, that's just a potted bit, Brenda. Thank you. So on you go. Yeah. On I go. OK. Um, well, I wanted to use um, Esther um, simply noting Purim, but as a, a springboard, as a launch pad for, for really what I felt the Lord wanted me to bring. And I particularly would like, with your indulgence, to uh, look at the the parable of the ten virgins uh, in a while. And I want to look at that from a point of view of the rapture. Now, not everybody uh, believes in a pre-trib rapture. I'm fully aware of that. But in terms of the rapture, whenever we think that that's going to happen, uh, there's a relevance in many of the passages teaching us about particularly about being ready whether it's now or sometime in the future in the middle of the tribulation end of the tribulation or whatever so if your position is not pre-trib rapture please bear with me um i think the teaching will be as useful to you as it is for me and everybody else um but i did want to start as i said looking at the the book of esther and using it as a, a launch pad now i mean brend has more than adequately coed teaching is just wonderful and we've done this so many times on this platform but uh i wanted to just pick out one or two headings and uh the, the first thing to talk about uh is hamas's rage against mordecai and his rage against the jews now that's very important because when we're looking at signs we're looking at what's going to happen and what actually is happening now what we are seeing is absolute rage uh, against israel the people of god the land of israel and the future of israel as a nation and as a people and that rage is increasing now today this morning i read an article in which I discovered uh, maybe I should have realized this would be the case, but I didn't. So that's against me. But that America, in this what I regard as a stupid uh, idea, and it's just window dressing, to 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 float or to take uh, men and materials across to Gaza and build a little jetty or a big jetty in order to receive. Uh, aid for Gaza, um, that the whole of that operation, which is going to cost millions of dollars, has been handed over to to Qat the Qataris. The funding of it, the managing of it, and of course, not surprisingly, the Qataris have handed over the contract to a, a Gazan company who are run by Hamas. Um, well, if if Eamon had rage against Mordecai, I can tell you I have rage at times over all the things which are going on at the moment, because that's that's the Antichrist spirit. It's the Haman spirit. It's the Amalek spirit all wrapped and rolled into one uh, that we're seeing uh, exemplified uh, now. And on top of that, um, we have the threat, a clear, clear threat from Biden, which is now confirmed and uh, Blinken has confirmed it, too that uh, unless Israel back off and basically suspend any invasion of Rafa uh, and don't do anything else unless their, their written plans have been approved by America, then America will not supply them with anything. They've already stopped supplying them with a lot of uh, ammunition, a lot of things, and uh, is is blackmail at one level uh, is fraudulent at another because at the height of well after the 7th of october uh, biden in his first remarks you would have been forgiven for thinking that america was actually on the side of israel and he gave a speech and he said i come to israel with a single message you are not alone you are not alone as long as the united states st stands we will stand forever we will not let you ever be alone and that sounded like 
a sort of guarantee that they could put that in the bank and whatever they did or thought or anything, whatever they needed would be provided. But actually, for many who've been tuned, tuned diplomatically uh, to the nuances of this speak from America over the years, it sounded very much like a threat. And certainly now we know that it, it was a threat and they are quite open in making that threat. I follow, I, some of you will too, but I, I, apart from dear Brenda, there, there are some really wonderfully anointed ladies in various places around the world. And one of them from the land from Israel is Caroline Glick. She's got a very clever older sister who works for the United Nations as well. But Caroline uh, has ploughed quite a lonely furrow, but with support from various people, thinkers, uh, theologians, military people, on everything from the beginning of the 7th of, of October. And one thing that she's picked up on is, again, Biden who's happy to believe the lie, which, of course, all those who are not likely to be saved unless they turn to the Lord are happy to believe the lie. God has put a, this great cloud of deception over the world, really, in these days, you know, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and the first eight verses. And um, she has exposed that the settler violence I mean, it doesn't exist, basically. Of course there's fracas, of course there's some problems, but no police account, no accounts from anywhere would prove anything that these anti-Zionist activists are saying. And these groups are radical NGOs, and they're all involved with the United Nations or UNRWA or um, other United Nations subgroups and they have been setting up the situation by harassing uh, the, the, the Jews in um, Judea and Samaria going about their daily business to try and get them to turn on them and threaten them or even attack them. And then they film them and then they put total lies with it. And that stuff goes straight to the United Nations within minutes. It's around the world. And we know that when Biden heard and saw at one of their reports um, that he decided there and then that he would have to threaten Israel and because of settler violence. Now, there is basically no such thing. Whatever, you know, the evidence does not stack up on the part of these people. But those who choose to believe the lie, and there are many, including our own government, including the foreign secretary um, will use that as an excuse for taking action against Israel. And the people who are involved in this, just so that you know how wide this is, this isn't just a few, a few people activists. This, these people are well-funded. There are many of them, hundreds if not thousands, who've been trained in this work to set up uh, Israel and the Jews wherever they can. They are aligned with the Democratic Party. Well, there's a surprise. Sorry to, but I'm very cynical. It, it's, they're al aligned with the Democratic Party and the State Department, including George Soros's Open Society Foundation and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Not surprisingly, when they put something out on Twitter feed, it is around the world, not in 80 days, but like eight nanoseconds. And the provocations that they talk about immediately get a response. So that now America, well, the, the president believes it and his entourage, Blinken and uh, the others. The UK believe it. The EU believe it. And so all become aligned together in action, threats, in rhetoric against Israel, 
all based on a lie. Seems to me that that's extremely similar to what the book of Esther reveals to us about Haman and how he builds it up into something which it never was and takes it to the nth degree, wanting to wipe out the Jews. If Mordecai is a type of Holy Spirit, which we many of us would say in, in our teaching, then we need, do we not, in this day and in this age, perhaps even before today is finished, the Holy Spirit to give us more wisdom and understanding and discernment about these matters so that we'll go deep in order to find out uh, more and more about the truth. Because it's the truth, it's God's truth that sets us free. No other truth, they're all rel relative. And, and as they're founded on man's thoughts, they're not truth. It might be data, but it's not truth. Interesting that, again, the attitude of all the countries now, and as I mentioned, the US has aligned itself with Qatar, which means it's now fully aligned with Iran and with all of, of, of Iran's uh, subsidiary groups uh, who are waging war in different ways against Israel and are all agreed and united, both as a Shia and to some extent a Sunni uh, thought about getting rid of Israel. Not because necessarily of, of hatred, although there is hatred inculcated in Islam from the start against Israel, but because there's a great inferiority complex within Islam. And if they let Israel survive, then that they're feeling the pain, they're feeling the heat. Because if Israel survives, then that suggests strongly, doesn't it, that the God of Israel is greater than Allah. And they cannot let that be. So fine words and liberal ideas will not do anything to change that. Only God. How wonderful that God is appearing to so many Muslims in dreams and visions. And how amazing that so many know it's him. <laughs> they know it's the Lord Jesus and are converting. How wonderful that even in Gaza, war-torn Gaza, we've had over 200 Palestinians come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and join the church. That's a 20% increase from 1,000 in two congregations <laughs> to 1,200 in, in short order. God's on the case, but only God can do this. The Holy Spirit has to lead us at this time. But the rhetoric... The rhetoric is as evil and spiteful and vengeful as anything else. And Channel 12, Israel's Channel 12, reported two days ago, or three days ago, that Elon Levy, who many of you will have heard presenting the Israel government's official position on the war, a very well-spoken, articulate young man, um, has been... Uh, suspended by the Israeli government uh, department because he fronted their English language response since the 7th of October. And Channel 12 claims that he's been sidelined following a complaint from the UK over a tweet that he sent in reply to Cameron because Cameron had tweeted in his sort of idea of diplomatic language, we continue to urge Israel to allow more trucks into Gaza as the fastest way to get aid to those who need it. Which actually, when you understand that and break it up, that's saying Israel is stopping it, then they're starving them, it's genocide. 
you know, all of that rubbish. And Levy responded, I hope that you're aware also there are no limits on the entry of food, water, medicine or shelter equipment into Gaza. In fact, the crossings have excess capacity. Why don't you test us and see? Send another hundred trucks a day to Karim Shalom and we'll get them in. Now, just for replying in that way, he hasn't been rude. He's not condemned him. He's not threatened him. He's not said you're stupid or anything else. Just by factual answer, UK government put pressure, Foreign and Commonwealth Office put pressure on Netanyahu to suspend him. Now, it's not the same as 50, 60 being killed in one episode of fighting in Gaza, I know. But it's symptomatic of everything that's going on. As the rest of the world, led by the West, become Haman to the Jewish nation today, demanding, in effect, and trying to ensure that they can't win Therefore, they will lose. And the whole nonsense of a two-state solution is designed. It's been rejected so many times, even, even by the Arabs. But nevertheless, those that are blind, their problem is that they can't see. <laughs> so you've got two administrations on either side of the Atlantic who, who can't see very clearly. But they think that's the answer. They think they'd trade land for peace. Well, that's been tried and tried and tried so many times, and it will not work. But they're determined, and Biden has threatened he's going to make it happen. He's going to force it to happen. He wants the elections to be carried out in November with that as a big tag for his success as a president. You see, when sometimes when we read the scriptures, we don't, we, unless the Holy Spirit leads us, we don't ha we're not able to connect the dots. And that's eschatological. The book of Esther is actually looking ahead. It's a very prophetic book. And it's looking, it's looking at when God rescues or comes for his people. It's more, for me, it's about the second coming. Not about a rapture. But it's about when Israel are saved. And Israel need to be saved. And Israel has the saviour as their Messiah, but they don't all know it yet. And many still refuse to accept that. And of course, that is not, it's not a popular thing to say. But on the other hand, we see the lies and deception, which Jesus warned us about, number one. That's deception is off the Richter scale. All over, honestly, you might feel, I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend anybody, but our, our government, we were great at deception in the Second World War. We're even better now. And one of the means of, of deceiving the world and painting pictures, positing pictures, is through the BBC. <laughs> I, I have a lot of time for Melanie Phillips. She's just written an article this week, came out yesterday, actually called the Hamas Broadcasting Company. And in it, she gives so much detail and how there are three groups in the UK checking every single thing that the BBC does and verifying it or showing where this is based upon lies and exposing the fact that time and time and time again, their reports about genocide their reports about killing that israel lured palestinians to the food wagons and then opened fire on them to kill them which is now being repeated by american leaders as truth came from three palestinian journalists associated with hamas the bbc Reporters don't speak to anybody else. So what they're doing is just taking unverified, non-fact-checked information, comments, views, and giving them as truth 
so much so that we find again that Cameron has accepted some of those reports as being true and is what he's now repeating. I, I could go on, but the purpose is just to try to illustrate this story is about rage and anger and hatred against Jews. In, in Haman's rage, the rage against Mordecai, who's calm and collected and is a type of Holy Spirit, and he's not going to get any change out of him. So he wants to just go straight on. And he wants the, the edict sending out. Well, we know the story. And we know that for such a time as, as that, Queen Esther was called. We know that she was challenged by Mordecai as the Holy Spirit is challenging each one of us. She was challenged, are you prepared to stand in the gap? I'm going to suggest there's not many people who are prepared right now to stand in the gap. But Israel at, if you like, the international level, at the church level, you find very few in this country. Church leaders are more likely to side with Hamas and the Palestinians, not with Israel. I, I don't know where they leave their Bibles. Do they have special pockets in their cassocks where they can hide them? I'm not sure. Anyway, um, that's just a caustic comment from me, but they don't quote scripture. They don't seem to know end times prophecy at all. They don't seem to understand the danger that we are in. In fact, uh, I think, is it the Birmingham Diocese or one of those now Wolverhampton? It's just advertising this job for somebody to come and uh, sort of be a spokesman for people who feel they've been hurt by white, privileged uh, Christians. It's just even Welby's trying to distance himself from it now. But then he's just raised a billion pounds uh, in a compensation fund for people who feel that the church has abused them in the past. I would have thought the best answer is to lead people to Christ and to share Christ with them, don't you? No amount of money is going to save them. It's not going to heal the deep wounds. Only the dear Lord Jesus can do that. That's why he's God. That's why he's our saviour. That's why he's the Lord of lords and the king of kings. Hallelujah. And Esther was really challenged. And when she hesitated, Mordecai tells her why she should. Because it depends on you. Because you called for such a time as this. I really think that is such a prescient word now because what's left of the church and, and and i'm not in one way saying much about that because it is a remnant bride that will be taken to where christ is that's his prayer in john 17 the command really is to go and to accept that she's offering her life as a living sacrifice which romans 12 1 and 2 tells us to do and she does it goes forward to touch the tip of his spear which could have led to death instantly and maybe maybe for some of us it, it might cause us maybe not death as such but to be cancelled, to be jailed. You only have to think a prayer and the UK police are likely to arrest you and challenge you and want to do something about that. Our new draconian laws hidden behind this smokescreen of digital identity and digital control and security are designed to control Make no mistake, 
This is a totalitarian state, not under the leadership of whatever party has been elected, but under those who are part of something bigger, whose plan is to control the world through a one world government. Back to Haman, back to the spirit of Amalek, back to the Antichrist, who will manifest himself, who will be seen in the tribulation period, who will step onto the world stage into a, a temple built on the Temple Mount and will demand to be worshipped as God. He will desecrate it. Then, sadly, many will see that they've been deceived, of which a good proportion will escape to be saved. But it won't be all. It'll be a remnant. God's judgment is upon us all. But he's given us Christ to be our saviour and to be the doorway or the gate, a narrow one, into eternal life, into heaven with him. So as we look at the news, we see these things and many more being fulfilled. So just quickly, if I may, just to run through some points that I really felt to make about she look old. The, uh, the ten virgins in Matthew 25. Now, the text, if I was going to use a text, because I think this is, this is all rapture talk, uh, must be 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 to 18, where Paul writes, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Paul adds, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Well, I think the text is bad news to those Christians who believe that the church has taken the place of Israel in God's plan. Simply because if the church replaces Israel, then you are forced to put the church in the tribulation. Why? Because the purpose of the tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation. So what's the point of putting the church in the tribulation? The church, the true church, is already saved, hallelujah. It's already the bride of Christ. The bride is already saved. It is sad. I have uh, two of Stephen Sizer's books, which I got some years ago. And although he was removed from the Anglican church, he still travels the world speaking at seminars and conferences on replacement theology. And as best, he can only call us Zion's Christian soldiers. That's the best accolade that we get from him in another of his books. But the rapture is bad news also to those who believe the tribulation has been and gone and that we're now in the millennium period, which, I mean, clearly we are not. And it's bad news for those churches of which there are many and quite big ones who believe that their job as the church is to prepare the kingdom now for the return of Jesus in other words, to deal with everything, get it all fine and dandy, and then it's in a beautiful state, ready just to receive him as king. But it is great news for those who love the Lord and serve him, despite all the troubles and persecutions and trials that the world presents. Praise the Lord. I love 
Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. It's something that I missed for years. I confess it. Missed it for years because I never used to preach much on uh, the prophecy and on fulfillment in Revelation. But in Revelation 4, 1, we read that a voice spoke to John saying, come up here. And in the context of the chronology of Revelation, that makes it a rapture revelation. I love John 17. I already mentioned that in passing, where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and is in an intimate time of fellowship in prayer with the Lord, with Father. And in verse 44, Jesus says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. That's such an intimate, heartfelt prayer of love, isn't it? He wants those who Father has given to him, those who become followers of the way, those who will become known as Christians, those who will be the bride of Christ and the one new man. In other words, Jesus is talking about the rapture and he's clearly looking forward to it as we are. In John 14, 3, Jesus tells the disciples about the rapture and says that the reason for it is that they, the disciples, may be with him where he is. And that's wonderful news. Well, says the reverend skeptic, there's no, no such real person. It's all nonsense because the concept of the rapture was dreamt up by an 18th century clergyman called John Darby. Not so, says the reverend rapture pastor. For the rapture was known of and preached and discussed and written about by the early church fathers, even by the Essenes in Qumran who knew all about it. Ex extant evidence exists from Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Cyprian and Ephraim, the Syrian, in absolutely plain statements, believing in and teaching in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. In other words, for them... It isn't for everybody today, but for them, it was an established doctrine of the church. But what we have before us, I want to suggest to you in the parable of the ten virgins is pre-tribulation rapture proof. Because it warns us of the perils of not being ready for the Lord as he comes with the trumpet call of God and the archangels shout to fulfill his promise to save us from the time of trial to come, which is given in the letter to the churches in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. So you have the trumpet uh, call of God, and then up, up comes the dead first, and then those who are still alive in Christ. The Apostle John, writing in his first letter, chapter 3, to the church, says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as, as he is. And then he says this, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. In other words, those who have this hope live with the anticipation, even the expectation of the imminence of the Lord's return at any time. So what do they do? Those who have this hope of his appearing, well, they purify themselves. They get their affairs in order, so to speak. They get ready and they are ready because he can come at any time. In the words of the late Reverend Dr. R.T. Franz, former principal of Wycliffe Hall, Oxford, who commented on this parable, said, to see the bridegroom as Jesus himself seems warranted in the light of Matthew 9.15. This would be a bold figure for him to use as the Old Testament frequently describes God and not the Messiah as the bridegroom and Israel as the bride. He also said it's a warning addressed specifically to those inside the professing church who are not to assume that their future is unconditionally assured. All ten are expecting to be at the feast. Until the moment comes, there is no apparent difference between them. It is the crisis which will divide the ready from the unready. The Holy Spirit, in a way, is that crisis because of the oil representing the Holy Spirit, the oil in their lamps. The rapture, whenever it is, but I would say the rapture lies in the reason for it, is in God's tender love and mercy. 
because by his grace, by his grace, the everlasting God says he did not appoint us to suffer wrath. He says also he's promised to save us from the wrath to come. That's amazing and, and so heartwarming to know that God, his foreknowledge of us, his choice of us before the world was created includes that sense of love and desire that he should save us from his wrath, which is going to come, his judgment on an unbelieving world and unbelieving Israel. And clearly, no one can be a true Christian without the indwelling Holy Spirit. As it says in Romans 8, chapter nine, verse 9, now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. So in this parable of the ten virgins, Jesus probably did not intend a separation between spirit-filled and non-spirit-filled. The distinction more likely is between true Christians and false believers. Nevertheless, a key to Christian readiness is to be constantly being filled with the Holy Spirit. As Paul admonishes the Ephesian church in chapter 5, verse 18, it's a present imperative. It's a continuous imperative. Go on being, being filled. Much of the weakness and the defeat and the lethargy in our spiritual lives can be explained if we're not constantly being filled with the Holy Spirit. The parable of the ten virgins contains a clear warning of what will happen if we're not ready. For his return for in verse 10 the prepared ones the five wise enter the bridal chamber with him and then the door was locked verse 12 the five foolish maidens are banging on the door asking to come in and jesus says truly i say to you i do not know you they were not allowed to come to the wedding and the door was shut against them in the strongest terms Matthew 7, 22 to 23. And in verse 13 of Matthew 25, we read, Therefore, you must habitually be watchful because you do not know the day or the hour. Now, I have since discovered that that saying is Jewish idiom. They would say you don't know the day or the hour. They would say that about, particularly say, about the Feast of Trumpets. And so what the priests and the, the scribes would do and the temple authorities is when it got near to what they thought would be the new moon, the Feast of Trumpets, they would send a number of men up onto the Mount of Olives to keep watch until they saw the first sign. Then the men would hasten back to tell them, and then they would send out the runners with the torches to say, it started, and the trumpets would be ready to be blown. In other words, they did know the day or the hour when they were clearly looking for it. Price for failing to be ready is too high. Jesus was speaking to them, the, the Jews in that chapter, about their salvation, but his words also apply to us. The parable is prefaced in Matthew's account by three other teachings, which it occurs to me are definitely linked to the parable and our preparation for it. So we can read in Matthew 24, verses 32 to 35 and 36 to 44 and 45 to 48, a number of important warnings. The bridegroom will come when it be like the days of Noah. Everybody's just doing what they always did and a bit more beside. Honestly, that's where that's where we are. That's where the Western nations right are now. It's as much the fault of the church for not making the gospel well known, not revealing Christ in their lives, not revealing the power of the Holy Spirit, 
but our young people by and large are not interested they don't see relevance they don't want to know they'd rather live now and pay later but there are generations who've neglected worship neglected the means of grace and they just look after self so no longer is the i am the lord jesus christ but the i am is in everybody that's just living life to the full in hedonistic delight and pleasure the bridegroom will come when it will be like the days of noah that's why personally i think it's any time but one will be taken the other left i suppose a bit like the wife five, the five wise and the five foolish God's people have got to be watchful and prepared, ready to grasp the nettle like Esther, ready to take a huge risk, ready to lay down their lives for the sake of the gospel and for God's people, Israel, to stand in the gap for them, to pray, to beseech God, to see what's going on, speak out against it, to write the letters, to, to take on, whether it's the politicians or the church or whoever it is, Otherwise, nobody will know. If we keep, keep quiet, evil will just prosper. In Matthew 24, verses 45 to 48, we're clearly told that the faithful and the wise will be found serving. They'll be found serving the Lord, doing what he's commanded us and called us to do and be. Not hypocrites. Not telling others to do what we don't do, but actually doing it, leading by example. The par parable tells us that we must always be ready for the wedding feast, the consummation of our relationship with the Lord Jesus, and that only those faithful and obedient servants will enter. And we're warned that even though the groom is expected on his return from the father's house, back to John 14, 1 to 6, but that will be delayed or can be delayed because it's father's pleasure when he decides everything is ready. But the shout and the shofar are sounded ahead so that those who are watchful and waiting will be ready. The oil does symbolize knowledge of the Torah in the Old Testament and of the word of God in the New Testament. It is also a symbol of joy and of the Holy Spirit, and therefore of gladness. How glad it makes us to be watching and waiting, to be leaving about his soon return, and that we will be one day with him where he is. Since 1948, when Israel returned to the land and the nation was reborn, the fig tree, i.e. Israel, was there israel being regathered and ready for the lord's second coming matthew 24 32 to 35 makes clear that this is god's sign that the summer is near that jesus return is very close or as some translations put it he's at the doors me I felt the Lord again and again and again, reminding me that I must make myself ready through knowledge of scripture, through an intimate relationship with God in the Holy Spirit, by focusing on him, looking up, because our redemption is near. I've seen all the signs. Lift up your heads, because your redemption is near. We see all the signs around. How wonderful. God calls us to be stargazers, but not looking at the stars, but looking at the star, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's coming, I believe, is very soon. And I thank God that the parable of the ten virgins, the whole story about Noah and the ark, 
the story about Jonah, all too point to the rapture and the need to be obedient and ready. Boy, God does love us, doesn't he? He doesn't want us to miss anything that he's got for us because it is all out of this world. Amen. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Andrew. That's given us lots to think about. And I know there are varied views on on this and um but it it behoves us to be ready and um my daughter i want uh, just stay listening cuz julie has three boys and um she she says that at this moment at this moment they're not walking with the Lord and um, nor is her husband and so she said she was laying in bed last year one night and it came into her heart to prepare a rapture box so please stay listening <laughs> a rapture box I said what what is that so um, the more she spoke about it, the more I felt that, that this was a wonderful idea. <laughs> so she said she was going to put a letter in the box to say that if she and Nana and Grandpa <laughs> suddenly disappeared <laughs> one day, um, that this was the biblical <laughs> this was the, the the biblical explanation of what was happening so she was going to put in the box she she gave me a list of the things that were going to go in the box <laughs> and uh, she was going to put in it to be opened uh, if such and such a thing happened so they'd know what to do to attract was going to go in the box um the, the bible verses where it, it, they could find it and uh, and she said um you know the more that she thought about it the more ideas she got about what the <laughs> put in the rapture box <laughs> so I, I thought, you know, if people are living with unsaved people, that it's a wonderful idea to have a rapture box. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> do you think that that would be good? Yes, and, I uh, think so. Yeah. 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 And, <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we know kind of lots, lots of stories as well some funny and some some quite serious um yes but the um the thing the thing that andrew's bringing home is is recognizing that there are varied opinions but the best thing is to be ready mm. to to be ready to meet the Lord because um, it's um, it says like in the days of Noah and there were so few ready mm. to get in to be saved and be and go into the ark. My son, I know I've told you before and I'll just leave this one with you before we uh, we we end up with a song because we've not had any worship tonight. Um, my son um, backslid when his best friend died on his wedding night. And um, 
so but before that he was a worship leader intercessor and i believe that's the call on his life anyway a few years later for my birthday card there was a picture of the ark and the animals going in two by two the classic picture that was the front but on on the plank going up was a pantomime horse <laughs> clearly, <laughs> clearly two men <laughs> two men in a cow costume and the <laughs> and underneath the caption said Two desperate sinners make a last bid for safety. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to me, I felt he was trying to say, you know, um, don't worry, worry about me, I'll be there. <laughs> and, and, uh, yes. Yes. So God's given me better than that he's given me verses um, and I'm sure you're all praying for your families. And uh, so, yes, it's it's strange that, that whether it was pre or post rapture, a lot of people say, oh, I'm a pan millennialist. it'll all pan out in the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it, it, whichever it is, it's not far away, and we Amen. must be ready. Mm -hmm. So it's good to have messages that encourage us to be ready for the Lord. Mm. So, Maggie, um, um, I'll just tell you one or two things in case people are, are leaving. Next week is a very, very different week because it is Good Friday. Now, we do know that we keep Passover, but it is still a good opportunity to ponder on the cross and to meditate on it, to meditate on the cost of our salvation, on the amazing the amazing biblical truths that are there the more I go into it the more my heart you know I've I've written so many songs I've written so many songs about the cross and it's come through looking at the word and then getting a fresh and deeper revelation because there's far more in there there's far more in there than we could ever imagine and um so next week we're going to i'm going to ask those that are coming on to have um communion things ready some mat sauce or, or bread and some um, wine and we're going to take communion together. We're going to have Jed and Nicole Robine with us who are really, really um, special servants of the Lord and, and they're going to help us to, to go a little bit deeper into these this wonderful subject. So that's next week, um, but Wednesday we've got our healing Zoom at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, so in, in coming weeks, as we go into April, we've got Colin Urquhart coming. Um, We've got um, an all nations ministry prayer leader coming who's trying to gather prayer for the UK. And, and I'm, I'm praising the Lord that there are these prayer initiatives being raised up 
all over the nation because that's the only thing that is going to change things. So that's that's me. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, Aggie and Susanna. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Christine, that you faithfully put up the uh, the cat the the readings so that we can follow in our Bibles. Thank you, everyone, for coming on, and um, we hope that we'll see you next week. Now, so we're just going to go out with. Um, one of the songs and so I'm I'm just thinking about which one is the most appropriate um, to what I, um what we've heard today. Maybe the, maybe the spirit and the bride Brenda. Yes, I think so and that's number one. Mm. So here we are the spirit and the bride say come come um, and uh, so bless you and oh I will just say this uh, before this song um, mm -hmm. those of you who've been putting in the chat that you'd like the St. Patrick CD um, send your address to me on dovetail Brenda at gmail.com it's very simple dovetailbrenda at gmail.com and we want to welcome you back Richard Smart you've yes. been a yeah. long time yeah. in Africa and doing an amazing job and um, we want, wanted you to settle down but we're hoping to hear a bit more about what's going on in Africa mm. <clears throat> In in one of the uh, one of the meetings that will will arrange a time for you to share something of what's going on. So, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Yeah, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat yeah. Shalom, everyone. Yeah. yeah. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.